Welcome to the Natural History Cupboard. Come on in. And welcome back to the Natural History Cupboard podcast, the place where the weird and wonderful parts of the natural world come together. I'm your host, Gareth, and with me as always is my co-host, Aaron, and now Aaron's sidekick. sidekick Stay yeah. high. Third, third host. Hi, how you doing? And no, this... no, I was waiting for the snake to say hi. All right. Uh, a snake of very few words. Yeah, he's not very talkative, yeah. is he? Yeah. Yeah. This is Draco, formerly Percy, but I, I, no offense, I, I didn't really like that name. No, I'm I'm going to take great <laughs> offense. I don't like animals with two human name, apart from Bob. That kindly works for a lot of animals. Mm-hmm. I've known a lot of animals called Bob, and it <laughs> weirdly works. I've known a yeah. chimp called Bob. Uh, a few dogs called Bob. I don't think I've ever met a Bob. A talker's an called Bob. Bob. All animals that I think work quite well with that name. It's mm. just such a almost generic but not generic name, if you get what I mean. Mm. Well, Draco is actually the, the what, what I was going to introduce you to him ages ago. If you remember, I kept saying I'd introduce you, but never got round to it. So there you go. Now you've seen him. Now you don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So other than handling uh, that snake there, what else have you been up to? Uh, actually, not much in terms of wildlife this week. I've been um, just been, other than working, I've been working on my van. Fair enough. I mean, it's all in sort of preparation to go out into the wild and yeah, see yeah. stuff. So, Well, i tell you what, though, actually. Um, a friend of my brother's, who I've become very friendly with, too, uh, has been traveling in Europe this uh okay. over september yeah um camping wild camping Very because nice. europe are a little bit more sensible about wild camping than britain are um and uh he sent me this video that i'm gonna put up now uh of um <laughs> where he was wild camping mm-hmm. you can see just in the distance a, a wolf Oh wow! Watching That's them. cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was in the in the Alps in Italy. Nice. So that was probably not a Eurasian grey wolf. Probably the Italian grey wolf, which was separated on the other side of the Alps, on the Italian side of the Alps, for a long time. I think it's like something like well, it's thousands of years. Yeah. I can't, I can't remember what it is that, now. That would be the the symbol of Rome as well. Yes. The Italian grey wolf. It's yeah. And it's a um, it's a completely different haplotype. Mm. So it's, so it's, it's the most distinct um, European wolf. European wolf, yeah. Even more than the Iberian. Wolf. More than the Iberian wolf, yeah. Wow, that's uh, the cool. Iberian wolf and the Eurasian wolf have not been separated nearly as long as the Italian wolf has. Or I think they call it the Alpen Alpen wolf. Just makes it sound like muesli now. It did, it did didn't it? <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. That's yeah. pretty cool. Um, yeah, so yeah, enjoy that video. Mm. I have done very little, actually. Um, tried to go and look for some fish the other day in the mm. uh, in the, the local river, but the tide was out, so it was too far away to see anything. Did see some, um, uh, some oyster catchers and a few other shore birds, and I'm getting this, this week, I'm getting my students prepared for one of their bird watching trips they've got to do. Oh nice. So it has been a couple of weeks now of what is this bird? Mm-hmm. Let's get everyone ready to know what the difference between a herring gull and an egret is. Yeah, I'm or sure I remember you doing this last year. An eider duck is. Yes, so yeah, did it last year. Um just basically spending a good amount of a lesson uh preparing them to be able to actually spot different birds, introducing them to the the Merlin bird app which is really useful as well. And I'd highly recommend that to anyone Hmm. go on a walk with that recording and see what you find. Um, Really quite cool. Uh, Yeah. Basically just getting them ready for, uh, for their first trip. And I was looking at the weather forecast for next week. Uh, It's not looking great. (laughs) So they'll probably hate that, but Oh, well should be fun. Yeah. Saw some good stuff last year. So hopefully see the same this year. Yeah. Yeah. Should we uh, head into the news? Let's do it. It's the news! 
Okay, so I'm starting off this week with uh, I thought I'd get the bad news out of the way with quickly. Let's do it. So rip the my, bandaid off. Yeah, my article comes to us from fizz.org, and the headline is first polar bear spotted in Iceland since 2016 is shot dead by police. Um, yeah, it's not great. So <laughs> the gist of this is that the the police basically apparently had no other option other than to shoot this animal. It was robbing a bank. No, as far as I'm aware, it was in the north. Uh, um, sorry, it was in the northwestern tip of Iceland. I can't. I stuck there because I can't pronounce the name. So I'm not going to try. No, it's not even worth um, it. But uh, basically, this polar bear was in like peak condition, really good individual, and uh, apparently, it is just too expensive to transit them back. Which I think is when it comes to that's ridiculous. a species that is struggling the way polar bears are, and you're saying this specimen was in perfect condition. Um, seems a bit of a, a shame to, that money is the yeah is the is the only barrier. Do you know what I'd like to add something to that that yeah. I had some of my students say that actually shocked me a bit the other day. So I started talking about uh, climate change, and um, one of my students went. Uh, I was talking about you know effects of climate change and, and stuff like that, and one of them said, um, "Polar bears are extinct, aren't they?" And I went, "Well, no, not yet, but you know, give it time." So it's it's sad to think that that's actually in the mindset of some of uh, of the the younger generation is that you know they're, they're basically written off um, in some yeah. ways. So. Well, well, maybe 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 you didn't notice that your kid wasn't actually awake at that moment and was just having a premonition of, of the, of the future. inevitable future. <laughs> um, okay. I'll start worrying if they start blurting out, you know, you will die at this point. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, right. So moving on, um, this is uh, from actually all of my articles this week have come to us from uh, some of our listeners. Uh, these ones have come to us from Louise O'Leary mm -hmm. always sends us some really interesting stuff actually. Um, this is from Science Alert, and it's something strange is happening to the calls of Amazon parrots. So Amazon parrots are a lovely mid-sized uh, bird from Southern America. Um, these ones are, sorry, hang on. These ones are yellow-naped Amazons um, and are quite, uh, a quite common species, but they actually have distinct regional accents. And it would appear that some of them are starting to pick up on different accents of different regions oh, right. uh, in a way to, that basically allows them to chat up the ladies or talk to each other <laughs> um, in different regions, which could be a survival advantage. Mm. I mean, Amazon uh, parrots are known for being, uh, you know, good at imitating, but they're able to basically speak different dialects of Amazon parrot uh, to each other. So, yeah. Smart. Uh, well, my next one comes to us again. It comes from, in fact, all three of mine are from fizz.org. So, yeah, this one's from fizz.org. And the headline is, Early dingoes are related to dogs from New Guinea and East Asia. 3D fossil scanning study finds. Mm -hmm. So this is the news that basically archaeological research that's been carried out by Sydney University. I think it's actually the University of Sydney is correct. Yeah, name. yeah. It's um, basically found uh, that there are clear links between the the animals in that in that region basically uh and this suggests that the dingo can trace its origins back through new guinea to east asia and that runs against the kind of current idea that they came from the pariah dogs from thailand yeah mm. well, that's pretty cool so Next, I have live science, uh, and that would be 80 million year old sea monsters' jaws filled with giant globular teeth for crushing prey discovered in Texas. Hmm. Uh, I love the word globular. Globular, it's yeah. quite cool. This is a rare fossil, uh, mosasaur species known as Globidens uh, alabamarensis. Uh, could you get, take a guess where it was sort of first discovered? Uh, um, it's a 20 foot long predator with strange mushroom shaped teeth. Uh, and it's basically been unearthed in northeastern Texas. Uh, these uh, these mosasaurs are thought to have been feeding on like hard shelled prey and just using these uh, these massive like blunt force teeth for crushing and smashing the shells of things like ammonites and, and other uh, mollusks and that in the sea. But still a pretty formidable predator up to 20 feet in length. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. 
Um, and my final article for this section of the news comes to us again, like I say, fizz.org. Uh, and the headline is Unraveling an Ancient European Extinction Mystery The Disappearance of Dwarf Megafauna on Paleolithic Cyprus. Cyprus really? is. One of my uh, one of my favourite places that I've travelled to. Always um, wanted to go there. It's I've very always, nice. Always wanted to go to the the sort of buffer zone in between and mm. see like a an abandoned city sort of thing. It's very interesting, like the like the the Greek and Turkish influences over culture there. Mm. Um, yeah. Anyway, basically, scientists have um, discovered that uh, the reasons, or at least a huge contributing reason reason uh for the disappearance of the only two species of megafauna that ever existed on cyprus mm. um now these were uh during the late pleistocene it was a 500 kilogram dwarf elephant which is paleoloxodon cypriotes and the 130 kilogram dwarf hippo phanarius minor um both species disappeared just after humans arrived now humans arrived about fourteen thousand years ago to yeah. uh to, to cyprus and unfortunately within a thousand years of their arrival they'd wipe these animals out shocking yeah, very, very <laughs> quick uh it's weird to think that that's a paleoloxodon mm. uh from the paleoloxodon genus which right here in the uk at that same point yeah. you would have had paleoloxodon antic i think it's antiquus and which is a yeah giant mm-hmm. you, you know mate, that would have dwarfed an african elephant and yet right the way over in cyprus you've got these diddy little yeah it's baby versions it's island dwarfism isn't <laughs> yeah. it it's always mad to think mm. so my final one is south african rock art depicts 260 million year old extinct animal study mm. suggests now i think this is a rather dubious one but it is worth looking at uh, and it's basically pointing out that the indigenous people of Southern Africa may have been painting long extinct creatures from 260 million years ago, long before Western archaeologists described the fossil. Now, uh, the fossils are, that they are talking about are dicynodonts. So um, Lystrosaurus is a dicynodont. Uh, and a lot of these animals have been found fossil wise in the Karoo uh, Basin in Southern Africa. So there is precedent for these animals' fossils being found in parts of Southern Africa. However, this creature uh, that is depicted in a painting that was painted in eighteen uh, in eighteen thirty five, at the latest, which is not actually as long ago as I was expecting for this, um, is said to be. They think it's a dicynodont, although we've both looked at the picture and. Mm, it looks no. more like a walrus than anything i'm not getting yeah. dicynodont it looks like a sausage with two bits at the end of it it does yeah i'm not seeing dicynodont even even remotely um it just doesn't look right uh and it doesn't even appear to have much of a head to it either no but the article uh, essentially says um that it was 10 years before western scientific discovery and the naming of the first dicynodont by richard owen in 1845 so i think there's a bit of uh, i don't know almost like trying to be ca- counter counterpoint just for the, the sake of it yeah. you know someone's trying to get a name on a paper here. i have nothing against the idea of saying that people who lived in the area would have come across fossils because that would be a stupid thought to think that they hadn't but i think it's a bit of a push to say that this is uh, the first instance of paleo art of a dicynodont based on a rather rubbish drawing. And let's face it, 1835, people have known how to draw for a very long period of time um, mm. and how to draw better, as our creature feature will elude on, as you'll see very soon. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't buy it, I'm afraid. I don't buy it. I wonder if... I, I, I wonder what it is, because it's definitely not... Dis- well, I can't say it's definitely not dicynodont. Just to say it's not just a picture look. of a fat snake. Yeah, yeah. There's more or, of that. That's more likely. Occam's razor would something suggest... Something from their mythology. Yeah, would, yeah, yeah. Would be, some, would, would be where my mind went to, seeing that photo. But, yeah. yeah. Anyway, tell us what you think it is. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah, and that'll about wrap up the, uh, the this week's instalment of the Natural History Cupboard Newsreel. Guys, if you have news articles or topics of interest at home that you think we should cover, just like Louise O'Leary did, mm. uh, and 
in fact, Louise O'Leary deserves a massive shout out here because she always sends stuff to us, and we sometimes are a bit slow to catch up. But we got three of them oh, done. No, I, I, I so, purposely saved those for this week actually because mm, I thought it'd be good to have. Right, yeah. well, they were they were good articles. But yeah, thank you, Louise. That's amazing. Uh, and if you like Louise, have uh, such things that you'd like us to share, please send them on in to us. You can any of uh, any of the usual ways: email, Facebook, uh, rubbish, uh, rock art, painting. <laughs> <laughs> but there's it could be disappointing some ghost somewhere. <laughs> uh, criticizing his work like that or her work like that get better uh, but yeah get get that into <laughs> us and we'll do we'll do our best to cover it here or in the main topic and the main topic is with me today now i'm gonna ask you uh and our listeners to bear with me a bit on this one because this one it it's come quite late it's come to us from atasara um it's come not not super late but late enough that when the news about it starts to change, right, it makes it a little bit hard to follow and a bit weird. So originally, uh, what I, what what she um what Atasari had, had sent in is basically that um a woman had been attacked by a shark off the coast of it said off the coast of the Canary Islands, and it said a certain mileage, which we'll get onto in a minute. <laughs> Uh, and that mileage is quite far away from the Canary Islands, but not so far away from another place. Uh, <laughs> and it it seemed like the basically it was just off the coast of Morocco, and it seemed like the Moroccan authorities were kind of shoving it onto uh, shirking responsibility onto the Canary <laughs> Islands. And between us, we got conversing, and we we started to to come up with possibly some. So possibly some worrying geopolitical trend theories or maybe just tin hat conspiracy theories but we're going to get into it anyway the news has since at least changed its wording but you'll notice that the wording there's so many articles on this mm. and depend where you go especially if you go more right-wing news sources oh i bet that's really interesting it becomes very much like in fact i'm gonna so I'll get on give to us, it. I'll give us your craziest interpretation. So we'll start with The Guardian. Uh, their headline is Spanish court opens investigation into fatal shark attack off Canary Islands. They're going to charge the shark. they open they? this one up. So basically, this is the news about a German woman who was sailing. Uh, she was on a British catamaran. A, Brit- a, a catamaran that is registered to Britain, uh, that is. Um, and she died, unfortunately, after being attacked... Uh, by shark. Do we know what species of shark? We'll get onto that in a minute. Oh, okay. Yeah, because there's some some other bit of related news coming up. Um, it says that she was sailing 270 nautical miles, so that's 500 kilometers off the coast of Gran Canaria. Um, according to the uh, country's maritime rescue service, that's Spain's maritime rescue service, Salvamento Maritimo. Uh, the 30 year old woman was traveling on a British flagged catamaran, the Dalliance Chichester, about 110 miles uh, west of the Western Sah- Saharan city of the Um So that tells me she's far closer to to uh, to Morocco. Yes. Than to the Canary Islands. Yes. So no. that's something that happens off the coast of Morocco. Yeah. Now, I understand or my 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 vague understanding of of this relationship is that the waters there are kind of disputed and by disputed i imagine that means that when the country wants to take credit when when <laughs> one country wants to take credit for something it's their sea yeah and when, when something goes when, wrong it's yeah, yours it's yours so yeah um basically the this the, again this is from the guardian the the moroccan authorities asked uh the salvamento maritimo uh, to lead the operation effort as it had no rescue craft in the area. Now, I mean, considering... Morocco does have quite a big coastline. It has a big coastline, that's true. But uh, considering how close this was to the coastline, mm. I wonder just how how far away they must have had to be. They may not have that many rescue vehicles. That, that's the other that thing. That is true. Um, uh, Funding-wise, I'd say that Spain has got an awful lot more money to spare than Morocco probably does. But... That that is true, or at least I'd assume that's true for like Spain as a general mm. entity. However, the Canary Islands, I would argue, they probably don't. Have, they probably have more 
in terms of the but this that would be something really interesting to look I into. I bet you they've got better um, kit in the Canary Islands than kit, Morocco. But the resources are very much stretched on the island. Once you get the casualty to the islands, yeah. the resources are very much stretched. Um, so unfortunately, the woman lost her leg in the attack and suffered a cardiorespiratory failure on the helicopter flight. She was pronounced dead um, once she got to the hospital in Las Palmas, Gran Canaria. Yeah, that's a shame. Um, so yeah, the uh, basically. Um, the Dalinch Chichester left the port of Las Palmas on 14th of September. So the boat actually left from the Canary Islands mm -hmm. before making its way to the Atlantic. Uh, during the time that it was it was sailing, the Salvamento Sal Maritimo crew had rescued 122 people that were trying to make a small boat crossings from Africa to the Canary Islands. Yeah. Um, so you don't tend to think of that uh, certainly not in the, in the UK we tend to just think of issues like that happening just over the channel not yeah. uh, from mainland Africa to uh, to the Canary and Islands and that is a particularly dangerous stretch of water that is yeah, I mean we think the channel's bad and it is a very dangerous stretch of water if you don't know what you're doing but yeah I can't even imagine trying to get across that what is a very deep channel of water from mainland Africa to uh, to the Canary Islands. With a lot of predators in it. Yeah, well, it's open water. Do you, yeah. Well, I don't know if... You, like, this isn't the thing that we'd normally cover here, but um, but about 5,000 people died in the first five months of this year alone trying Eesh. to make that crossing on small boats. Um, so, yeah, that was The Guardian. I, I did want to go on to... So, um, you asked me what species uh, it could have been. Now... Uh, article that came out after this one mm -hmm. uh in fact this one came out in fact this one came out today yeah um is uh there's a kayaker in the canary so this one come it comes in from the express uh and it's canary islands kayaker stares death in the face as shark circles in harrowing video i wouldn't call the video harrowing <laughs> i i expect the experience was very much a butt clenching scary moment that yep. I don't particularly want to find myself in. Yeah. Uh, and that's someone that's me saying that as someone that wants to free dive with sharks. I don't particularly want to be in the situation this kayaker found himself in, uh, where he was being circled by a uh what what I could only describe as a very hungry hammerhead shark. Oh wow, that's a proper open ocean species that yeah and this is just off the coast of la palma which is one of the smaller canary islands now they, they are actually known to be somewhat aggressive they can be aggressive yeah. yeah um now i wouldn't say that they are kind of that that's their go-to mode though no they, no, no they can be known to be aggressive but they're pretty they're pretty like kind of placid species until I would, to a, up to a point i would love to see one they're one of those like really you know the the ultimate like if you had a list of sharks, they're up there with great whites mm. and tiger and and things because they're just so well known for well they're so easy to spot basically. Uh, but I wouldn't want to be in the water with one without knowing full well that it wasn't feeling particularly hungry. Hungry, yeah, or or the knowing <laughs> that like knowing that you weren't disturbing it, yeah, as well. So in the video, in fact, actually, before I get into the video, the actually the the bit that I wanted to outline of this of this article um it 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 actually speaks to this so social media users tried to play down the incident by insisting hammerhead sharks are normally not aggressive towards humans and like me yeah. and gareth have just discussed they're usually a placid species but they are known to get aggressive towards humans at times in certain state uh, circumstances yeah yeah now the next line even though the species has been linked to last Monday's incident involving a 30-year-old German travelling on a pleasure craft called Dalliance Chichester. So that's referenced in the article that I'm talking about. And it's written in bold red letters. Of course it is. Because it has to, of, of all the things that you can say about sharks, you have to highlight the, yeah, most the danger. Yeah. So basically the reason why I chose this article is because it's an interesting geopolitical uh, uh uh, issue that could very directly affect natural species and when that happens it's always the natural species that come off worse yeah uh, especially sharks what we got to thinking 
we were discussing this at length uh, a little bit um and then we continued the discussion uh, in text messages as well later on and what we got to thinking and it might be it it might be valid or it might be completely tin hat mm-hmm. but because it's a disputed uh, stretch of water where this uh, attack happened uh, and because it was closer to Morocco, but the Moroccan authorities were so keen to push it onto um, onto Spain, and because of the wording of some of the original articles that we looked at was quite different to the wording of the articles that I found yeah. uh, over the last couple of days to, to use for this, we wonder whether, that because there's been so many shark attacks off the coast of Africa and they're moving up that way, whether this is an attempt to, you know push the incident onto Spain in the public subconscious mm. so that Morocco still seems like a safe place to go and bathe. I mean, I I could kind of see that, but you said this happened outside of Dakar, didn't you? Yeah. yeah I mean, Dakar's not... Uh, you know that the Paris-Dakar rally hasn't been in not Dakar. Da- not Dakar. Not Dakar. Oh. Dakar. Oh, see, I was going to say, because I thought the Paris-Dakar rally hasn't been in Dakar for a very long time mm. because it's not considered a safe place to be. Mm. In which case, it doesn't matter how safe the water is if everything on land is not particularly safe. Yeah. So, uh, I would be I would be tempted to say that neither of them want to basically own up to having anything like that. But no, then again, I, I wouldn't. But but sharks are a part of you know the fact that you're in the ocean. That's... Yeah, the the Canary Islands don't tend to have many shark attacks because, especially Grand Canaria. Grand Canaria has um, it's just the way the be- the beaches are there. Although I can't remember if it's Grand Canaria or one of the other Canary Islands. Not long ago, a a, a young shark got uh, on a high tide, got pushed into what is a sea pool, and then oh, well, the tide went out, all and the, the shark time. was trapped in the sea pool like uh, for a while. But um, I've seen that happen in Australia before. Used to, yeah. There was there was one that we used to go to uh, quite often as like a seaside town that we would go to called um, called Robe, and uh, there was a sea pool there, and there would be all sorts of things that would just get washed in. There was never, mm. I knew when we went there, there was never a shark that got flushed in there, but there was at one point a small uh, shark, like a. I don't know, something, you know, the equivalent of like a, a, a reef shark sort of thing, but Southern Australian, I can't remember what it would be, probably a young bronze whaler or something like that. Mm. Um, but yeah, we used to go in there and you'd find all the little baby cuttlefish oh, and yeah. lots of little like fingerling sized fish. They'd all get washed in there and it'd be brilliant because you could go snorkeling without actually having to go snorkeling yeah, yeah. out in the sea. Um, I mean... Not that we didn't go snorkeling out in the sea as well, but it was always just a nice thing if that was all you wanted to do and you didn't want to go too far out. But yeah, they'd be sort of trapped in there. It was, it was quite cool. Well, um, I tell you what, I'd I'd prefer to go down to the sea pool in the morning and see a shark in there and go, <laughs> oh yeah, I think I'll just observe today. Uh, <laughs> rather than go down there, get in the water and find out there's a box jellyfish in there. Yeah, that's true. Because yeah, yeah. that would be a very poor end to the day um yeah. now as i say just to re-emphasize that is our kind of tin hat theory and it it, it could be right probably isn't but just in case this is something worth having having to think about because yeah. this happened right off the coast of morocco where there have been uh plenty of shark attacks and they didn't send anyone out to help it was uh it was it was it was uh they uh shrugged it off onto the the spanish authorities to deal with Hmm. Um and either way, uh the I suppose the important thing is that um a, a young lady lost her life that day, uh, yeah. unfortunately. Uh and they're already without really any evidence, because as far as I could tell, no one has actually said like what shark species it was. It's already been pawned off onto the hammerheads. Hammerheads that are suffering. Yeah. And don't need any more bad press for no reason. Wow. Um, so yeah mm. well shall we move into slightly more less sorry shall we move into slightly less depressing yes. uh, things and talk about some real art yes not, let's do it. not these not this weird South African 200 year old sausage with teeth <laughs> art it's the creature feature Okay, well, we're into this week's creature feature. Aaron, 
Name a, a piece of art. A piece of art. Uh, that you think sums up the human experience. Big, deep question for you, about 10 seconds in there. Well, I don't know the name of it, but... <laughs> no, I was gonna. I was gonna be sarcastic. But no, you, name, can, like, you can be sarcastic. Salvador you... Dali, you know. Oh, Sometimes what the like scream! Time <laughs> melting and people screaming like elephants, like with really tall legs. Well, I mean, a lot of people would normally say something like the Last Supper or the Sistine Chapel. You know, the 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 sort of that. The, but that doesn't strike me as resent, like kind of reflecting the the human experience at all. True. That I mean. Reflects... Some a, a great Shine piece wealth. of art that you would say a lot of people would would put as uh, iconically, you know, humanity's best piece of artwork. Humanity's best piece of artwork. So does it have to be a painting, or can it be anything that is? I'm going to say painting. Art? I'm going to say painting because I'm not going sculpture on this one. Here. I wasn't going to sculpture either. I was going to say Star Wars. <laughs> All right, well, we'll skirt around that. I do agree <laughs> with you more uh, than, than that. So about 20, 000, or more than 20,000 years ago, um, early humans in southern France uh, were creating a piece of art that will last through the ages. And um, I personally think is more of a iconic piece of artwork that will sum up the human experience than something like the Last Supper. Yeah, that's or... literally what I was about to say. I, I would opt for that before I go for anything like this. This that. particular piece of art um, in the uh, the painting. Uh, sorry, this particular piece of artwork in the caves of Cognac uh, was essentially there for a very, very long time, created by people uh, pa uh, painting um, essentially what they were planning on having for dinner or what might plan on having them for dinner. The reason... Uh, for this cave painting to be so amazing is it captures a snapshot of what life was like over 20,000 years ago for people all around the Northern Hemisphere. It's just that this particular cave has, or the, the people who are living in this area, had the particular foresight to go and document what they were seeing. Mm. And inside of this cave painting, amongst many other animals that we no longer see roaming around uh, the UK and France as well, uh, it was a giant deer with antlers over three and a half meters wide. Um, so this impressive animal, Megaloceros, uh, or as it's usually known erroneously, the Irish elk, is the creature that we're looking at today. Uh, it's a species that I've always found a bit interesting. And my first encounter with any bones of one was in the Liverpool Museum, where at the end of a hallway, there was a megaloceros skeleton and it towered over you with this impressive set of antlers, mm. basically showing off what it would have been like coming face to face with one of these very big deer. It was big, yeah. Oh, yeah. So why the name? So it's sometimes referred to as the Irish elk uh, or the Irish deer. Uh, but these names are misleading because this is an extinct deer species which may have lived all over Europe, mm. uh, but it wasn't an elk. And it certainly wasn't isolated to just Ireland. So it mm. should be called the Europe Eurasian deer, mm. which just, it doesn't sound as cool as Irish elk. I must no. admit, if you're going for branding, Irish elk sounds much more impressive and, and things. But uh, no, it did not live just in Ireland and it was not... Uh, just, it was not an elk. When we say elk, we mean it in the sense of moose. Yeah, or, or yeah. European elk. Yeah, which are yeah. both in the, in Al the Alsus. Alsus, yeah. yeah. One's Alsus, Alsus. I think, I think the other one's Alsus, Alsus, Alsus. I'll have to double check. That. Yeah, <laughs> I think it is. I think it's. I think yeah. you're right. I think it is Alsus, Alsus, Alsus. I just keep thinking. I, I'm giggling in in my head because every time you say elk, yeah, I'm picturing. Um, there's a skit in one of the Looney Tunes cartoons where we it's uh, I mean, it's Daffy Duck, I think. He said, right. Shoot me, I'm an elk to Elba Fudd. Of course, he gets shot, if I remember right. But yeah, just, just cracking me up inside there. I had to, <laughs> I had to share it. Fair enough. <laughs> um, so where did this name come from? That's what we need to ask first. Hmm. So even though the deer once lived throughout Europe, most of the preserved antlers and skeletons for this species have actually been found in Ireland. Um, and this is certainly where the first specimens were found as well. Uh, and the conditions seem to be perfect 
in Ireland uh, at the end of the last ice age for preserving these particular fossils. Mm. At this time, glaciers were melting right the way throughout Europe, you know, raising sea levels and forming lakes uh, and rivers and things. Um, and it would appear that Ireland was particularly covered in lakes and bogs. Mm. Um, when we think of Ireland, we nice. think it's peat bogs and stuff like that. A lot of these were formed in and around these, these sort of times. That's a, a, a lot of their... Um... Mythology. A lot of mythology comes yeah. from all that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the antlers and the bodies of these giant deer would often fall into these lakes uh, and sink into the sediment where they were covered in, you know, mud and, and everything else in there uh, and preserved over time. And the first specimens of, uh, of these animals were described in Ireland in 1695 by an Irish physician, Thomas Molyneux. So Molyneux identified uh, the antlers... Um, of one of these megaloceros, which was found in uh, Dardistown. Uh, and they belonged, he basically thought that they belonged to an elk uh, or mm. in the elk family. Uh, and in fact, some of the early theories about where these animals came from is that they'd somehow crossed over from North America when there was a lower amount of sea level or something, uh, or was similar to European <laughs> elk. Uh, but the name stuck, basically. So the Irish elk uh, stuck. Personally, though, uh, I think the name that they actually have, Megaloceros, um, is a lot better. Hmm. Do you know what Megaloceros means? I was just about to ask you actually. Does it mean um, does it mean large horns? Yeah, literally, yeah. literally means large horns. I was I was thinking <laughs> Seros is definitely horns, but yeah. they've got antlers, not horns. Yeah, but it's um, Greek, so it's always yeah, going to come yeah. out like that. And then Mega, like it can't be as simple as, as no, mega, it's just big. There we go. Is big horns. Big horns. Do you want to take a guess at the species name? Because there are actually a few different species of Megaloceros, but the largest one uh, is Megaloceros gigantus. Yeah. Do you want to take a guess at what that one means? Does it mean tiny? Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's giant big. Horn. horn. Yeah, giant big horn. <laughs> <laughs> it would actually be a little bit funnier if it was uh if it was if it did mean little, because then it could be little big horn, which yeah. is a place. Micro so. microceros gigantic. Yeah. <laughs> That's a big deer with tiny little horns. So as you can tell, yet again, yeah. uh they got creative naming this thing. <laughs> well, that's more creative than Alsus Alsus, potentially Alsus. Yes. <laughs> True. Uh, so where and when did it live? So we know it didn't just live in Ireland. Um, the earliest fossil record for this giant deer is around 400,000 years old. Mm. Uh, and the last fossil is only 8,000 years. So they, they actually, that surprised me. They they were around further back in time than I imagined. And they they lived up until more recently than I imagined. Yes. So these That's are really one of the, the real last late surviving members of the Ice Age. Uh, they were also an animal that had been around for a very long time, mm. but just didn't cope enough to be able to make it through after, you know. So from Ireland and right the way across Europe uh, into northern Russia and Asia is where you would have found these guys in a big sort of uh, swathe across most of, of the northern hemisphere. Um, and some of the, the other species, you know, in slightly different areas, but generally these ones were found right the way across northern Europe. Um, for a very, very long period of time. You'd have found these guys roaming the plains of what would have been Doggerland, which is now right. the uh, the English Channel and the North yeah. Sea. So they live mostly in... Well, I wonder if you could take a guess at the sort of habitat that a megaloceros would inhabit, Aaron. Uh, do you think they lived in dense vegetation? No, I was going to say, well, it wouldn't be in, in, in thick woodland. It uh, would not. You're, you're probably talking about um, grassy plains that mm -hmm. are... Not too far from woodland, I would have thought. But, yeah. yeah. So they've basically looked at the wear patterns on, on megaloceros teeth, and they've looked at uh, isotope analysis of their teeth as well, and found that the diet of these guys was consisting mostly of grass, mm. for the obvious reason that grasslands were the dominant uh, habitats. I think the taiga and the steppes yep. of, of Asia, that's basically what most of Northern Europe looked like at this point. With... Uh, them also eating leaf, tr uh, you know, leaves off trees as well. So they mm. would have had some uh, vegetation other than grass in their diet. If you just look at the skeleton, it's kind of a giveaway because you wouldn't, you you wouldn't evolve 
such massive antlers mm. if you're in dense vegetation they'd be yeah. getting caught on everything and then also you you wouldn't evolve such a huge body size if you're in that much wood tiny yeah you need that big you you almost need that size on you to protect yourself from the predators mm -hmm. in, in on the planes well They'd give away either way we're going to get to what made their antlers so big in in just a moment mm. uh but yes you you are correct they they would not have been very good in a woodland um you know you're gonna suck uh, you're gonna really struggle if you can't go i can't um oh god there's a tree on either side <laughs> stuck of course there is there is one exception was that uh the the Mount of Thranduil, King of Mirkwood. Well, of course, yeah. yes. I mean, that's an elven megaloceros, so it's uh, clearly going yeah. to be better. <laughs> anyway, elven, elven the mythical Hobbit ones aside. Died, yeah. Uh, what did it look like? Well, I think you probably gained a bit of... Yeah, it, it looked like a deer. But we're going to go more as to what it's what it really looked like. A so, deer that has been put in the gamma radiation tank that Bruce Banner was put into. Or a deer that went to uh, like an Arnold Schwarzenegger seminar. Fair enough. <laughs> it's best That's known funny. for there is rather obvious <laughs> colossal antlers. Yeah. Uh, it's probably the best way of doing it. Uh, this is uh, this is what sets it apart from all, pretty much every living deer species alive today. In fact, Aaron, you've got some, some species of deer. I do. Not in actual live ones but we've got bits of deer so we're we're, we're well, one of these species i wish i had um do you want me to grab them now yeah yeah, yeah grab them okay, out, so yeah just for the podcasters or not just for them but especially for the podcasters uh the podcasters so the the audio the audio format listeners i'll describe what i've got in my hand so this first one is actually um one that i found out walking um which is a roe deer uh it's actually still attached to the the base of the skull there which is pretty cool so yeah this is the, not the biggest antlers in the world this would be where the 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 kind of the brow would come out towards the the nose end but you can see like apart from this one of a, a rogue hair from one of my dreadlocks um they're a little bit green because they've been out in my garden for a while but yeah that's a roe deer um that's probably as you say, that's a respectable size for a road. It's a road, road deer, yeah. Um, yeah. Hang on, yeah, yeah. Well, so I get the other two. The other two. Yep. So that one obviously that one obviously died, uh, for whatever yeah. reason. Um, and by the time I found it, he was just bone and antler. <laughs> he's he's not much left of him, you know. So you can see that he's still attached to the skull. It's not a, a road deer running around somewhere with half a face. However, these ones were shed naturally as part of the annual shedding of yeah. a of a male reindeer. Um, now he's not he's not a big specimen. Of, well, he was big, but he wasn't like a like a super big specimen. And and this is one you worked with. with. This is one I worked with. Yeah, um, Bramble. Um, I always think their their antlers look so much like sticks. Again. More I than need any to, other species. I need to clean them up. He's been in the garden for a bit of a while. Uh, there was still some. There was still the odd bit of felt on it when uh when I was working with it when I when I had them, so um I was putting them out in the sun to uh to kind bleach of them a bit bleach them a bit and you know Devon weather yeah and they've ended up green and I've forgotten about them um but yeah so you can I can take that one back off you so you can have a look at well, the if we were to between them if we were to have a set of megaloceros antlers in here at three and a uh, three and a half meters long. I don't actually think we'd get them in here. No, no, I don't. Three and a half we would, meters, we would not get them in no. this entire get, get, room. Almost, I we almost might get one. Myself. Pog, uh, the, the audio listeners just missed me almost smacking myself in the face <laughs> with a rogue uh, reindeer antler there. Yeah, rogue deer and uh, reindeer. Uh, but that that gives you an idea of the size difference uh, between some of them. <laughs> and uh, these the colossal antlers of a megaloceros were huge, um, and they. I don't think there's a deer species other than the moose that really comes close, no. uh, you know, in size. No, because European elk, the European version of the moose, is smaller than the American mm. moose, isn't it? So yeah, that's another creature feature like loaded up for the future. Um, so how on earth do we know what this animal looked like? I mean, obviously we have fossils, um, we have the skeletons of them, but we actually have direct eyewitness data as well. Now, if you cast your mind back to the very beginning, I was saying about 
uh, members of our very own species sat and draw this animal, uh, drew this animal, um, seemingly at a very high degree of accuracy for people just doing it on the side of a cave, um, because of the the paintings in cognac uh, in southwestern France. Uh, we also have uh, other cave art right the way throughout um, the the um, the northern hemisphere of various other prehistoric creatures that that humans encountered on a daily basis and would have hunted killed and eaten so this cave shows a huge variety of uh, wildlife that lived at the same time as well so so tar uh, in there as well which is another species an odd looking animal but really cool um it's a type of, of bovid like a cow yeah um there are also ibex uh, which we still have today in the pyrenees and um, yep. other parts of uh, spain and france um all sorts of different creatures that would have been roaming around that would have probably featured on our menu. Um, if anything, maybe it was just a giant cave painting menu. I'll have that one, please. Okay. Yeah, can you imagine? It's out there. Go and catch it. <laughs> so all of the cave art uh, that depicted um, this fantastic deer species showed a rounded yet tall shouldered hump uh, on the back of these animals as well. Uh, with a sort of a crest of raised hairs, a bit like a um, what's been termed a, a, a tuft on their hackles. Hmm. So think of when a cat gets annoyed, uh, the hairs stand up on its back. Well, this is like a permanent sort of hump of hair uh, just behind their neck. But the interesting thing is, if you look at their skeleton, there is no obvious indicators that there was a hump present. Uh, and in fact, most fatty humps, think bison and and stuff like that in mammals very often have an underlying uh skeletal like structure to hold something them. to anchor it yeah. yeah and so bison have those big spine you know uh mm. neural spines that uh that things connect to um the muscle and, and the fat as well but this doesn't seem to have that so this uh would be interesting to to basically see in real life because it, it would obviously show show this off and we thankfully have those sort of eyewitness accounts to be able to tell us this we also have another fantastic bit of information that comes directly from these cave paintings we know what color it was or uh, mm. we know at least a to a degree yeah and what patterning it had so when most people think of deer species they probably have one or two concepts of like color in their mind mm -hmm. say fallow or chital deer with yeah. the orange body white dots across it um or red deer where it's that uniform rusty brown red with a big sort of throat of uh yeah. a thick sort of almost like a mane I'd, to I'd, them i'd also say that people would think of reindeer where you've got almost yeah. that dual coloration of like the grayish brown and the and then the more paler yeah kind of what we do have is a colour patterning for this particular animal, and it is nothing like any deer species alive, except maybe reindeer, mm. in that it's got some different tones to it. So some of these images show a dark diagonal line that extends from the side of the body of the shoulder of the animal to the edge of the groin. So imagine sort of the line going down yep. the body and sometimes across the leg as far as the hock which is the ankle. Um, but some of the better images uh, that are more detailed, one of them on a stalactite, uh, shows what looks to be a dark vertical stripe descending from the shoulder hump, forming a division between the neck and the rest of the body. Um, and it's it basically gives this sort of weird, uh, dark stripe across the animal, essentially, right, giving yeah. it a very different look to most deer and having a white uh, patch on the neck as well, like really making it stand out. This is an animal that already stands out with these massive antlers, and now it's got very different coloured fur to most deer as well. Mm. Um, now, Aaron, you know what their antlers look like. Yeah. Yep. You yep. know what the deer looks like and yep. what colour it is. Who do you think its closest relative is? Oof. Um, well, I, it's not the, it's not the elk moose, uh, group. No. Um, even though that was what they thought, uh, they thought they were. No. And I can see, I can see why, but, but I suppose as you are more exposed to this kind of thing, you, you tend to pick up certain 
scientifically based prejudices that you no, then... No, I, I would say that it's not one that would be obvious. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. I certainly See, I wouldn't was... have lumped it with it, but give us give us your best thought. Can you tell me what you originally thought, or would that give things away? That might give things away. Okay, okay. okay. So just, just throw take, it out there. Can I take three puns? You can have three guesses, yeah. So what the Americans call an elk, the wapiti. No, but that's a good guess. No, right, okay. Um... Not in any way close, but it's a good guess. Uh, okay. Um, probably my favourite tiger prey, samba deer. Not a samba deer, no. No, no. okay. Oh, okay. Blinking egg. Because <laughs> uh, I definitely wouldn't go down the route of, well, obviously not elk, like I said, or, or moose elk. Uh, and I wouldn't personally go down the red deer route, but now you're making me think that maybe it might be red deer. It is not red deer. Shall okay. I put you out of your misery? No, because no, that wasn't my third guess. <laughs> my third guess is I felt a bit like Aladdin there, cheating a cheating a wish out of you. Um, okay, I'm just gonna go. I'm gonna go for a random. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna go real, real left of field now. Okay. Reeves roll, Muntjac. <laughs> That's where I was going. Yeah, Reeves Muntjac. <laughs> It is not Reeves von Jack. No, that would have been a good one to go with, actually. I was just thinking, Anon, you... you... Go for the smallest you can think of. You know, you know, bush dog related to maned wolf. Yeah. No. So. so my thought would always have been red deer. Because no, I don't see in most deer. of the original paleo art of this animal, mm. it is depicted to basically be a giant red deer. They even, yeah. in a lot of them, give it that same uh, mane on its on its throat. To make it look very similar, I can, I can see that as much as I can see originally people lumping them in with moose, but yeah. I I no I don't I it's, don't see them. Like it's that. that sort of, um, I would say, Eurocentric, you know, sort of view of them being yeah. the the biggest animal around is clearly it a red deer, so therefore must be the, the bigger version of that. But in fact, its closest living relative is the fallow deer. No, an animal that looks nothing like them. No way, an animal that. You really would not think uh, the, they are closely related to, but Colour yes, fallow deer. Shocked and amused. So not a particularly big deer, and one that I think is quite pretty. Not native yeah, to the UK, yeah. but has become somewhat naturalised uh, thanks to the Normans introducing them. Yeah. For for hunting, but um, yeah, that is the closest living relative. How, um, I mean, how many of our our deer species are actually native? Two, the red and the roe. No, I know that was oh, a right. rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, moving on from that. Um, why on earth did its antlers get so big? Um, the enormous antlers of this deer uh, were not only difficult to manoeuvre uh, and would have taken an awful lot of energy to grow, would have severely limited your ability to collect food in, say, a forest. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, um, to grow big, you'd have had to have put in an awful lot of effort eating grass. Yep. Uh, so why on earth did this species bother to grow such big antlers? The answer's simple, and it's it's right the way throughout evolution, uh, right the way throughout nature, absolutely everywhere. They did it for sexual selection, yeah, to basically show off uh, and prove that um, they are the most perfect physical specimen, that they are so well off in what mm. they are doing, they can expend extra energy growing massive ornamentation to make themselves out as uh, impressive as possible. Yeah. The same thing that peacocks do uh, to basically make their lives, well, a lot harder for flying, certainly when they've got that full train, getting up into a tree for a, a male peacock is quite a, a feat, but they still do it. In fact, when they're in full feather um, that time of year, they make up 80% of Indian leopard diet. There you go. It's only the really, uh, really, well, it really on it and really mm. powerful and, and uh, impressive birds that are going to make it through and not become leopard food because yeah, especially leopard gauntlet. I mean peacocks have got it rough they've got leopard they've got sloth bear they've got dole they've got um, tiger mm. all in the same parts of uh, the forests that they live it's exactly what's trying to eat them so having that massive t uh, train that that tail uh, is a huge draw, you know, like uh, energy expenditure on them just to be able to go through mating. And it it's a way of making yourself out to be the physical perfect specimen to the females. So it's exactly the same thing with this deer mm. and would have probably impacted its life greatly. Um, and they would have also used them for the obvious 
uh, thing that uh, that deer use their antlers for in the rut, which is, well, to fight one another. And there's nothing more impressive than uh, big, full-grown male deer absolutely slamming headlong into each other and fighting each other yeah, with those wrestling. antlers. I mean, that's where red deer, I, I think, are so impressive. And wapiti as well. Wapiti, yeah, Incredible yeah. animals when they go into a fight. And it is brutally like aggressive. But they don't kill each other. That's the important thing. If they wanted to, they probably could do mm. severe damage to each other. But it's all about a pushing match to push the other one out of the yes, way. Yeah. And they'd have, uh, they'd have fought in uh, a lecking ground, exactly the same as, as birds do, um, to basically prove that they are the big dominant male uh, in that area. And then it could have been an impressive sight to see these animals roaring, uh, you know, like red deer, um, just basically proclaiming their territory. We'll be hearing that here soon. Yeah, I, that would be an absolutely amazing thing to go and see. So when did it disappear and why did it disappear? Um, this is an animal that was probably pushed to extinction by not just one thing, but a combination of things. Uh, an animal or plant might be able to adapt to one or two changes, but generally when you have more than a few of them, relatively quickly, most species can't cope. And that's what finishes most species off. Um, the first wave of extinctions for this animal happened around 12,000 years ago when it disappeared from Ireland. Ironic, because most people think of it as being the sort of the place where it lived. It was mm. actually one of the first places it disappeared. Uh, Britain and most of Europe as well uh, at the same time. So we we lost ours around 12,000 years ago. During this time, it was the, the last days of the Ice Age and the climate was was very cold and severe, but the food for the deer would have been uh, scarce and they would have found it a lot harder. What would have made it worse uh, is having to find enough food to grow those enormous antlers. So you're already placing a huge amount of survival pressure on yourself. And that would have made it harder for these deer to be able to adapt and survive uh, coping with the change and also trying to still keep what, you know, still keep up that uh, growing of antlers. They take an awful lot of work. Uh, but this period wasn't the end of the story for the uh, this this animal. After some carbon dating of um, bones in central Russia, um, one group of them appeared to have been living around 8000 years ago. So they hung on in certain places, a bit like the mammoth did in, is it Wrangell Island, where Wrangell they Island, they, uh, yeah. they hung on until about 3,000 years ago? Uh, yes, because it was when the Egyptian, the, the, yeah. the, the, the pyramids of Giza had been finished. Um, I think it's about 3,000. Yeah, the, the problem is with that population, the inbreeding and, and the, the increase, the, 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 uh, the rapidly decreasing resources and yeah. stuff pushed them to dwarfism and then eventually, you know, inbreeding. And then... Yeah, and it's probably the same thing that would happen put... with these deer as well. Towards the end, there would have been less resources, more pressure on them. Uh, and as the forests spread at the end of the Ice Age, we start to see the grasslands disappear. So Doggerland that we talked about, uh, which is now the North Sea, disappeared mm -hmm. under the North Sea. And what do we start getting spreading throughout Britain and most of Europe and, and Eurasia at this point? is forests we start to see broadleaf trees and coniferous trees taking over uh and obviously if you've got antlers that are three and a half meters wide mm. you're not getting through those forests so your your habitat of uh of grassland has disappeared severely so that's pretty much it and and unfinished really but as you could always guess with any extinct species that has been around at the same time as humans Guess what? Here comes humans to finish them off. So although we have relatively little evidence uh, for people hunting this species, it would be silly to not think that people are hunting them. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, humans are nothing but resourceful and we would have made use of every single animal uh, that we would have found. And if, you know, if you happen to know that that large deer, if you try and chase it towards a wooded area, it's got no escape. You're going to take that advantage, yeah, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, and we know that Neolithic settlements as well were expanding at the time uh, and removing large areas of natural vegetation. So it basically meant that the last few vestiges of this animal were hanging on when humans started to really expand. And slowly they just disappeared. So rather than driving them to extinction, we, we just, just pushed them over factor. the edge. We finished yeah. it. So that leads me to... to 
my the question I was going to ask, although I think you're, the the answer is probably obvious now. Um, we we talk quite a lot about de extinction and, mm-hmm. and cloning um, and all that. You know the uh, um, colossal biosciences and all that. Um, with mammoths, thylacine, dodo, and passenger pigeon, I see, I'm I'm beginning to see strong arguments for all of them, and the environment is still hurting from their loss. Yeah, are we saying that the environment, that the that it was to quote Ian Malcolm, um, nature had selected the megaloceros for extinction. Yeah, I mean, we were just the final nail in the coffin. It wasn't. It it was their time. Yeah, uh, there's. There's many things that probably pushed them over the edge. Humans were certainly one of them. We didn't finish them off, but we certainly didn't help things by mm. being humans. <laughs> um, but they are an animal that got to the end of their run and the world was changing and they couldn't keep up. And unfortunately, that was it. And I don't think it would ever be a species that even if you could somehow find a perfectly preserved one, uh, you know, I don't think there's no the extinction argument. would really be would be worthwhile. No, there's no argument there for them. The, the animals that well, they're are... saying that now, actually. Yeah. If you look at how much of the UK is covered in open grassland farmland, I'd actually say they'd have a better time of it now. Yeah, <laughs> but it's whether or not they. Then we're doing the unnatural. Yes. Because the argument that I make for for mammoths and thylacine and and and. Uh, the two pigeons that I mentioned um, is that yes, the tech that we're using is unnatural, but what we're actually doing is reversing an initial unnatural crime. Yeah. Uh, so what we're, we're actually reinstalling the natural, whereas we, whereas with this, it sounds more like it would just be a vanity project. Yeah. Just to do it. Yeah, definitely. So there's other animals that clearly it's like the, the dire wolves and the wolves. Yeah. The wolves were just better at being dogs than the dire wolves. And that's were. why, you know, all the other species of deer that we see today are considerably smaller. Mm-hmm. Red red deer can easily disappear into a forest and yep. they are our largest land mammal in the UK. Even even a moose. They're just can better disappear. at being deer than the yeah. megalostrus. So yeah, it's it's one of those last great experiments that nature had in the absurd, but uh, unfortunately didn't make it through till today mm. so if you get a chance go and check one out in a museum most museums certainly in most parts of europe and i'd probably even venture at saying there's got to be at least a few in north american museums if you manage to see one they are impressive antlers so yeah mm. right well should we uh i just remembered uh the la probably one of the last times that the two of us and drew played arc together oh god Gareth was building this this big base and he's like sorting out all these these uh these things for the dinosaurs to go into, and me and uh, Drew were I think we were mounted on Argentavis flying over to the to the to the uh, tundra zone, picking up Megaloceros and dropping them in your kitchen. I and, think I vaguely like, remember a massive that. herd of Megaloceros in your kitchen. I think I vaguely <laughs> remember it. I think I was probably annoyed at the time, but oh well. Right, there let's you move. go. <laughs> Let's move into our emails for this week. <laughs> Bing! You've got mail. Ooh, it's an email. Right, well, we are into our emails for this week, and we're going to kick things off with last week's question, which was, what is your favourite aquarium fish species? Mm. Uh, this is after your tetra. Um, so the first one that we've got uh, comes from Tara Lynn, and she said, the Ranchu goldfish. Which I don't like. Yeah, I, I've got to admit, I'm sorry, Tara. Um, both of us are not particular fans of <laughs> of uh, all the different breeds of, of goldfish. Mm. At least it's not the one with the god awful goggly eyes. Those things, just... uh, with the poking out either side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I, I I view goldfish and koi and all of that sort of uh, bred species, or you know, bre- breeds of fish, as it were. Um, very much in the same way that I see like designer dogs and everything. Mm. There are a lot of people yeah. who will spend a lot of money and will do- uh, dote on those fish every single step of the way. But I'm quite happy with what Mother Nature has given us. Um, yeah. You know, I I would be very happy. I'm not saying I want a wolf as a pet dog or anything, but um, I'm quite happy with what we've, you know, w- what a wild goldfish looks like. Um, as I we was saying before, they can live 
anywhere up to 40 years of age and can get upwards of you know a good meter or so if mm. if they're in the right conditions so uh i don't really see a need for all of these designer breeds i'm absolutely sorry if we've uh have offended you tara it's just uh i think that's just the way that that both you and i feel about breeds of yeah i've designer never designer breeds as it were yeah yeah even to the point that like all the fantastic colorations that you can get for corn snakes and yeah. the two that I like are the two natural ones, naturally occurring ones. Can't improve on nature in my mind. No. no. And also, I mean, that was that was the that that pop culture quote that we do at the end of every episode for the first season. That yeah. was that was the point of that one, was it? Uh, no, one wonder no Maximoffs. <laughs> no more mutants. Yeah, which is if you if you actually read that comic, that is dark. That is. <laughs> I hope they somehow find a way to do that in the MCU. Anyway, back on topic. Uh, our next comment comes to us from Spencer Seams, and he says, uh, "Sea nettles and cuttlefish." Very cool. Yeah, yeah. I like I like sea nettles. I would love to get uh, a decent jellyfish aquarium if I ever had the space or the money. Zara Jackson's put, I love archer fish exhibits, uh, and I really enjoyed watching the mating dance of our native dragonets. But, uh, absolutely stunning little fish as well. Uh, and I love watching the wee little sticklebacks making nests. They're an awesome fish as well. Sticklebacks mm. are brilliant. Yeah, yeah, sticklebacks are cool. Um, and then Jen Babs. Oh, very uh, she, rele- relevant she that I get to read this one. Uh, Jen Babs says, Neon Tetras. Boring, I know, but they used to fascinate me as a child. I've never had, uh, I've never had an aquarium. Always wanted one, but no luck. Uh, to which I answered the next episode, which would be last episode now, uh, might be right up your alley. And she's very kindly said that they're always up her alley. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't think neon tetras are born at all. They're no, my favourite. I think she fish. shares the same view as you. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you you uh, you're on, you're on the same boat. Um, mm. Neon tetras are awesome. Uh, Catherine Ames then replied to that saying, uh, "Jen Babs, yes, and these and guppies." I used to breed guppies, and they are very beautiful fish. My one bugbear with them is that if... They breed too much? They breed very easily. (laughs) However, if you have the perfect conditions, um, and my former um, uh, manager could could back me up on this, because we did have the perfect conditions, Mm. they just explode. Just, Just tons of them. And then they make their way into all manner of crooks crannies and crevices that you don't want them in yep yeah so yeah i i I look guppies are very beautiful but yeah they i do they do there is a slight annoyance that i get from them (laughs) (laughs) and then you're finishing it's finishing finishing it up we'll finish this off with my uncle who says uh uh, pete says sockeye salmon with chili sauce i think he missed the uh missed what the assignment was (laughs) um is uh was what we basically replied. I mm. I think I replied to that one. Yeah, you did. You said uh not really an aquarium species, and I wouldn't recommend chili sauce as a substitute for aquarium water, but each to his own. <laughs> yeah, but it does sound tasty, but not exactly what the uh, the assignment called for. So uh, that was last week's question. This week's question, uh, based on where's where's your where's your dear bits? Oh yeah, that um, sounds wrong. Um, based on well, only one. Of these is relevant. You still found the other bits, I suppose, technically. Uh, What's the most interesting thing that you've ever found whilst out on a walk? Would you say that's your most interesting thing you've ever found out on a walk? Would I? (laughs) Alas, poor Yorick, you knew. I've actually got it the wrong way round. There you go. Yeah. No, I've got. I've got the right way round now. Sorry. Yeah, I'm looking confused there. Yeah. What is that the most interesting thing, or have Uh, you found more interesting things before? This is definitely one of the more impressive things that I've found. Yeah. But I wouldn't say it's the most interesting. Fair enough. I would say the most interesting one is up in our little cupboard of curiosities there. Yeah. Um, which I can't open because of where I've put uh, the cat food. <laughs> but up there is a selection of fossils. Uh, and the ones that instantly spring to mind is uh, there's a massive ammonite just down here. Yeah. And then up there... There are some shark teeth. Yes, I they're would very say cool. that they are probably the most interesting things I've found because the history behind it. It's not just 
a piece of animal, it's a piece of history too. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And yourself? Um, uh, there's obvious, obviously fossils uh, mm. on there that I could could quite easily list off a, a good few. Um, the very first major fossil that I ever found, uh, a bit of turtle. No, sorry, uh, ichthyosaur rib. Um, and then other bits of ichthyosaur as well uh, over the years. They're, they're definitely up there. The one that I think probably strikes me the most was on a really perfect day uh, on a waterway in Dorset, going across basically boggy wetland area, hmm. um, looking for uh, water vole signs or looking for um, otters. I was actually looking, and this may actually reveal where I was, I was looking for the swoose, which is a hybrid swan and goose. And there's a oh, yeah. few of them that actually exist. But this particular one is quite famous in that local area. Mm. Uh, on that same stretch of river as well, there's supposed to be kingfisher. Didn't see any kingfisher, but I did see a cuckoo. That's the yeah. very first time I'd ever seen a cuckoo, which was very cool. That'll tell you what time of year it was as well. Mm. But I did find at the base of a tree by a river on a quite large patch of mud that had been flattened down several times, I found a huge pike skull. that About that big. I think I've shown you it before. And it was very obvious that this particular fish had been eaten by an otter. There's not much else that could have, have taken this animal down. This was a big pike. This is a duck-eating size pike. Yes, you've pike. told me about this, yeah. So I picked this thing up from underneath the tree and there was a couple of bite marks at the back of the gills, but the head was pretty much perfectly intact. It had been sort of baked in the sun. So it was, it's perfectly uh, intact. So I, I started wandering away with it. I was like, happy with my find and everything. And as I'm eventually heading back towards the, uh, the, the main road, uh, this woman goes, oh, oh, what have you got there? And I went, oh, it's pike skull. It's been attacked by an otter and you can see, you know, must have been one heck of a battle between the two of them. Mm. You know, that would have been an impressive fight to see going on underwater. I said, oh, I'd love to take that home and show my kids. Could I have it? No. <laughs> Just, <laughs> no. I found it. It's mine. <laughs> so, and you could see that she's just clearly someone that had everyone had just given her everything when she'd gone. I'd love to show it to my. I'm sorry that those kids didn't get the chance to see it, but no, no. <laughs> it's it's mine. I found it. It's my own. My precious. <laughs> precious. <laughs> Lots of Tolkien references. This yeah, actually. I know. Um, but no, that's that's probably one of the coolest things I've ever found is a huge pike skull because the teeth in it are just monstrous and also uh a chance to go and learn about pike go and check out the episode we did on pike mm, yeah, that's going yeah. back some some uh, some way there but yeah we did an episode on them and i think i regale you with that story again so if you'd like to hear that story again go back and listen <laughs> to that um but yes let us know what your favorite thing that you found along the way is to add to your own sort of natural curiosities sort of table or cupboard um, and you can do that by sending it in on our Facebook page, uh, also on our YouTube page as well, uh, and anywhere else that you might see it. And we will basically read out the comments next week. Yep. Um, if also, if you want to get in contact with us, you can do so on our email address, which is thenathistorycovered at gmail.com. And you can also send us in any thoughts for um, future articles for our news as well uh, to work uh, to that. And we will certainly uh, put them into rotation. But you can also get in contact with us in another way, which is uh, via our Patreon, which these wonderful people that Aaron is about to tell us about have done. That's right. Uh, so every week we like to shout out our uh, our wonderful Patreon supporters to give them a little bit of love back to mm -hmm. us. Uh, now, these are the wonderful cupboard dwellers who have been kind enough to support us on a financial uh, level. And those people are, of course, Fogtober, Jen Greenhall, uh, Connie P, Chelsea McKee, Nick to Nick, and Justin Knife. Guys, your uh, financial contributions are actively helping us here in the cupboard to kind of expand and improve. Um, and we are grateful beyond words. Really, there's no mm. no way to really uh, word that. But we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Those are two yeah. words. Yeah, I suppose so. Now we <laughs> we appreciate all of our cupboard dwellers and everything that you guys do to us. Do to us, 
do for us, <laughs> whether that be just listening and watching or sub- and subscribing or sharing, um, writing liking. reviews, yeah. liking, being a bit of a, for lack of a better term, an evangelist yeah. for the cupboard. Um, so Go and yeah. get yourself a placard, stand out on the street and shout about it. Listen to the podcast. <laughs> Listen, yeah. Um, but yeah, so fa- we thank you all very much. But if you feel that uh, we have deserved it and you're interested in joining our Patreon, you can head on over to Patreon website, uh, look us up, where you will find two options or two tiers by which you can support us. And that's the Animal Ambassadors and the Nature Nerds. And you'll have all the information for both there. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, and with all that said, the only thing that is left to repeat uh, uh and we will repeat it until we're blue in the face is just how grateful we are to you guys yeah yeah massive thank you so yes uh as aaron was saying you can get involved in a multitude of ways money isn't everything but you can help the podcast out by basically liking subscribing reviewing writing a comment even if it's a bad comment we'll take all comments uh because uh in- interaction is still interaction in the, uh, the terms of algorithms mm. and things like that although hopefully not bad comments uh but yes, you can you can get involved on all of our different social media platforms as well as wherever you are listening or watching us uh, is the best way to uh, to do that. So a big thank you uh, to our patrons and a big thank you uh, as well to everyone who gets involved, which Absolutely. does a really big thing. And that pretty much brings us to the end of this week's episode. So uh, big thank you, Aaron. You're very welcome. Thank you. That's yeah, in- interesting shark news. If uh, we'll see how that continues. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm sure it, yeah it will we'll see what happens shark gate as it were <laughs> and a big thank you to you at home for being here as well and we'll see you next time here in the natural history cupboard bye bye <laughs> one does not simply enter a forest as a giant deer with huge antlers cuz you ain't getting in there <laughs>